I'm Ken Canera, and this is Beyond Consulting, the only podcast focused on your career, health, wealth, and life after consulting. This week, we welcome Mike Grisco to the studio. Mike is the co-founder and chief financial officer of Atmosphere TV. Hey, Mike, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you bet. So, Mike, maybe we can just start by doing a little bit of a trip down memory lane. Would love to just hear your, your background and, uh, and kind of like what, what has brought you here. Yeah, I'm a Chicago native, born on the south side of Chicago, oldest of five kids. My mom was an ER nurse in a pretty tough part of town. You know, dad was in engineering sales. Yeah, we grew up in one of those, you know, you thought it was normal like to have, you know, close to 30 cousins who lived within, <laughs> you know, a mile of proximity. So that was kind of my upbringing and, uh, you know, ended up in the University of Illinois grad, big time guy. But while I was there, a couple older folks within my university that, you know, had gotten into, you know, different investment banking jobs. And it, to me, that was all of a sudden, like, you know, by my junior year, that became the target. I loved the fact of like how much training, how much insight, like deals, are, deals are pretty cool. And as well as the comp was, was pretty good out of school as well. And so... I did the, you know, apply to 30 or 40 different banks. I got, you know, rejected by pretty much all but but one and started at Lincoln International in August of 2008. Great time to start banking. Yeah, that was about a month before Lehman Brothers went under. And so, yeah, I ended up working, you know, on some pretty tough transactions out of the gate. But, you know, just watching the the deal volume go from those guys were clipping off like a, you know, an M&A transaction a day to it all drying up. And so I actually was part of a, you know, this, I think the second round of layoffs in March of 2009. I mean, I still point to that as like a huge life lesson for myself. And it was a real gut check thinking you're doing everything perfectly right. And then all of a sudden circumstances beyond your control will kind of flip everything on its head. And I think it's a timely lesson for everything going on in today's economy and, and market with, you know, more layoff news coming. But yeah, I think that really hardened me. And, you know, flash forward, I did a five-year stint with PwC, helping them start up their middle market investment bank group in the U.S. Did two years over in the U.K. for PwC. Which great experience. Got to work on a lot of corporate carve-outs for, you know, big, you know, blue chip companies you know, a lot of cross-border m and And so it was, that was a great experience. And living over in London was one of the coolest things my wife and I have ever done. Just being able to travel Europe and you know, taking full advantage of the, the UK's vacation policy <laughs> while, we were, while we were over there for two years. Came back to the States in 2013. Yeah, and around that time, I had seen a lot of middle market or smaller m and deals and was looking for more. Opportunity opened up at Moles and Company and jumped all over. And it was a chance to really, you know, level up to see that next, you know, kind of size of, you know, capital market transactions, you know, get to work on big bankruptcy or restructurings, house of defense, big strategic advisory assignments for large public companies. And so it ended up doing three years, but that was kind of the nine and change years of my investment banking career before taking my first operating role where I'm at today. Awesome. First of all, seeing two interesting parallels. So so one, <laughs> you're a Chicago guy like myself, uh, and I'm, I'm also one of a, a big family. I'm one of six. And uh, actually, my parents met at U of I. Uh, oh, so, nice. uh, yeah, so very, very small world uh, that, that I didn't know about. Did they meet at the library or did they meet at camp? Definitely not. My mom was uh, a Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority girl. And my dad, nice. my dad was in vet school, but he was he was so poor that he actually uh, worked like doing the busboy and waiter shifts at their sorority house to pay no for school. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, so that's how <laughs> <laughs> that's how they met. The perks of the job. There's not many to that. Yeah. She grew up in River Forest and he grew up in uh, a, a very different neighborhood. <laughs> probably probably like yourself. But uh, nice. Well, cool. So PwC, Moles, uh, investment banking. Then you make a kind of big giant leap to uh, to media. So then you went over to Chive, right? As a CFO? Yeah. And so just to give a little background, Ken, on, on the business, heavily involved in uh, both Chive Media Group and Atmosphere TV. At the time, uh, yeah, Chive Media Group was a men's lifestyle website focused on humor, hotness, and humanity, reaching 25 million uniques on a monthly basis, a website, app, but most of the revenue generation was through e-commerce. If you ever see, you know, the the Bill Murray t-shirts out there, you know, we're the official merchandise partner with Bill Murray. 
you know, today we're selling gold, silver coin, like rare coin runs with with Bill's face on it. We're even launching like a legal tender run in the country of Palau with Bill's face on it uh, today. <laughs> that business, you know, was ripping and it was kind of in this, you know, in the time of, uh, you know, with all the digital media darlings, everyone from you know, BuzzFeed to, you know, Vice and, and, and the rest, uh, you know, we're all, all on the rise. And so I had a chance to uh, work with the, the co-founders of, the, of Chive Media Group, Leo and John Rezig, back in 2014. It was actually the first deal I got put on when I was at Molus. Oh, wow. The guys were just coming off of a, you know, a monster 2013 year weren't sure what to do next. You know, the business had grown rapidly, was incredibly profitable. So we looked at a lot of different strategic alternatives for them. Everything from buying up some smaller competitors, you know, just think adjacent websites to doing a levered recap to even potentially selling. And so we actually got pretty far down the line with potentially s- selling the business to uh, Playboy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. At the end, Leo and John, you know, walked away from the deal, just couldn't get comfortable with terms. You know, in term, terms in the and the management team that was there at the time went our separate ways after you know working together pretty closely for 10, 11 months. Flash forward a couple of years, in twenty seventeen, the prior CFO of Chive Media Group was looking to move on to. They Leo gave me a call and said, "Hey, you know, would love to bring you down." For me, I think that's the big thing in like being in the investment banking world. I realized pretty quick that relationships and the ability to like you know build a network with. CEOs, founders, you know, executives is the most valuable thing about that, about that profession. I've had opportunities in the past to go work for, you know, different folks in that work, that were clients. This is the first one where I really jumped at it just because it was a chance to work with, you know, just two just great human beings. And I just knew there was more that we could do with the business than that was currently being done. And it was a chance to, you know, come in at, at a pretty senior role. And I was confident in myself, uh, maybe overly confident in myself in being able to, you know, make the switch and being able to like, kind of take the reins in a top level role. That's a great point about relationships, especially because I think I must talk about this on every single episode and it comes up time and time again. And it's funny because like when we're in consulting or banking, like when we're young, right, it's a little bit like we don't want to be fake, right? So we don't want to like be that guy that has to network with everybody. But like at the end of the day, it really does make a big impact on your career because like, for example, now you're working with guys that you knew before, right? And so you take a lot of the risk out of things too, right? In addition to, you know, getting involved with the right people. Yeah. And that's it, right? I was at a, you know, kind of a stage in my life and career where, you know, I just wanted to work with good people. (laughs) Yeah. No matter what happened with this business, like they were going to do the right thing by myself and my family. Had to move a a thousand miles south. You know, I had a one-year-old. My wife was pregnant already with her second. It was a big leap to kind of leave the steady, stable setup in Chicago. I think that personal relationship that we, that you kind of build was absolutely critical for making that an easy decision. I like the way you put it. You just like, you got to a certain point in your life. You just wanted to work with like the certain people, right? Life is too short. I'm guessing the the majority of your audience, you know, like they're in a pretty good, you know, financial situation. Yep. Obviously incredibly talented. And I, I think that's my, my, always been my advice is like, man, you spent so much of your waking hours working. Like you got to do it with good people. It just adds so much more to like just your overall well-being. Absolutely. Okay, so you're C- CFO, right? Mm-hmm. That sounds great. But most of us don't even know what the hell a CFO does, right? So, uh, yeah, okay, we, we know they're in charge of, you know, the finances of a company. But like, what is it? What does it really mean? It's one of those jobs that like you, you know, it can encompass so much within a company, right? Like, and especially as we evolve and we have more and more data information, and especially within a tech company, right, that was chasing a lot of different initiatives and verticals, it took a bit to really full, sink my, my teeth into, you know, all different areas of the business. When I explain to people, you know, what, what's in, what's in my purview as a, as a CFO, it is everything from capital planning and allocation. So that is true. You know, that is your financial planning analysis. That is budgeting. That is your setting the course of, you know, that sort of, you know, three-year vision. I think of my role very much as like offensive coordinator. Our CEO and leadership team is setting sort of that overarching vision it is my job to make sure that you know the playbook is set and everybody's running the same <laughs> running the plays correct i like that analogy yeah it gets easier by the day right like it used to be several years ago you know it was like a coaching staff of one but now i got so many good 
people, like making sure that things are being done. The receivers are running the right route trees and the rest. That, I think, far and away is objective number one. Two, the actual like external relationships as it relates to your effective investor relations, right? As it relates to the board, as it relates to external capital sources, as it relates to like tracking down you know, efficient external capital. That's a huge piece of this. All the other accounting administrative items that kind of fall under the purview, right? Because it is just table stakes that you have good numbers. It is closing the books accurately, closing the books monthly on time. It is good reporting of data. It is interaction with, you know, business insights on all your major KPIs, keeping folks accountable to those. And in addition to then all the administrative stuff, tax, you know, to benefits, to, you know, ins- you know commercial insurance. I would say from my prior experience, I always had more of a surface level view on a lot of a lot of different pieces of these, especially on the accounting and administrative side. So I was lucky enough to like walk into a pretty good like a very good team in like existing uh, system setup team. on that front. And then my entire career was spent in the deal world, right? And so I had the chance to sit in the room, right? So I got to observe and advise a lot of, you know, very good exec teams, a lot of bad exec teams, but it provided a lot of reps. And so there were certain elements of it from the capital allocation side, the strategic planning, the budgeting and and analysis that came very quick and naturally. Everything else I was kind of seeing for the first time. Sure. Right. It truly does boil down to like having good folks that work for you, you know, trusting that, you know, you just have to be able to let go a bit to know that, you know, you have to rely on other people where their technical experience is just beyond what yours is. And that's fine. You know, I think that's where, you know, some folks can get kind of hung up. Like, I don't know how to do, you know, A through Z that's under the CFO job. Yeah, not at I. <laughs> but the thing is, the training that you get going into investment banking, consulting, et cetera, right? Like you learn how to boil things back in the first principles make it formulaic and make a quick reactionary decision from it, right? So it's like the piece parts of like your decision making make it very easy to step into, you know, role, see something for the first time, react to it and hopefully execute it <laughs> the right way. And something we're observing, at least with middle market and lower middle market, private equity backed companies for, for sure. Um, I'd be interested to hear your take uh in terms of like tech and media, but the CFO role is definitely being seen as a lot more strategic over the last five, 10 years and less kind of accounting, right? It's Mm -hmm. like almost like the, the accounting and admin piece almost seems to be like, okay, you know, like you said, do they have the right kind of people in place and systems in place? But I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. I'm very biased because I- Yeah, go ahead, gloat. Tell us how wonderful you are, Mike. No, I'm (laughs) definitely biased because I absolutely skew more to the, you know, the operating slash like strategic CFO side. It's just my background and the skill set. And every, I mean, and and that's it. Every organization is different, right? And But I think if you are a company that is looking to undergo, you know, transformative change, bringing in somebody in early, as early as you can afford, right, to really take on that that strategic CFO role will just help execute your, your, your vision of going from like A to B. So yeah, for any of those CEOs out there, I mean, that would be my guidance. If it is truly more about optimization of a current existing business, then yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't need that. You don't, you actually probably don't even want somebody coming in there that's, you know, going to be trying to like, you know, drive transformative change. I think also, especially with business and operational KPIs becoming more and more kind of like table stakes as part of the reporting, right? Because now there's like direct ties to operational KPIs as it relates to financial performance and outcome, right? And it's like, that seems to be living more in the office of the CFO as opposed to like, oh, IT, right? <laughs> like question mark. Yeah. I mean, I'm very lucky to work with an incredible chief strategy officer and chief technology officer. So uh, Eric Spielman and Alan Diverzovich. And so they're engineers by background, right? And so just, I mean, Eric oversees our business insights team. We've had a couple of data scientists on staff for years, you know, just domo SQL ninja ninjas, you know, <laughs> just being able to build out um, because we are a data rich Company. Oh, I'm sure, right? Yeah. Every second of every day. The number of pieces of information that we we have at our disposal, it's like consolidating that is, is an incredibly large task. So that sits under the purview of, you know, CFOs in certain organizations, but not not in ours. And I'm, you know, pretty, pretty blessed that, uh, you know, walked into a situation where 
those guys, you know, had a lot of their, you know, s- systems and structures like, you know, locked, locked down. And what about making the transition? So you spent most of your professional life in professional services, right? Basically working on transactions for clients. What was it like switching into an operator role on a kind of a database, day-to-day basis? It definitely was a challenge. Chai Media Group at the time was, you know, looking to undertake a transformation. Leo and John asked, you know, as I came in to do just a full assessment as an outsider, you know, hey, take a look at absolutely everything we're doing. Dig in, ask questions, and then report back. And so I started in September. By early December of 2017, we had a pretty large presentation deck that was given to the C-suite guys at the time presented my findings that, you know, hey, we got to make some big structural changes and make some big moves. And, uh, you know, all of it was in the guise of, you know, we had, you know, some you know, some strong core businesses that were cash generative. We were chasing a lot of different initiatives. You're talking like eight or nine different things that yeah. the business was chasing that were kind of like new upstart things. Could not do it all, right? Like we just needed to focus. And the big thing that we saw as the opportunity was to build what would become Atmosphere. It is a is stream TV platform for business, 50 different audio optional channels. And so what do I mean by that? It is built for those screens that you see in your everyday life, you know, in a gym, in a doctor's office, in a bar, a restaurant, a laundromat. If there is a TV in those spaces, it is typically, you know, not playing audio. We've all come across those screens. The content that most venue owners put on those screens today is content that's designed for in-home. You know, we like to say TV for business isn't broken. It was never right to begin with because it just took a TV that was designed for in-home with audio consumption. So you get a lot of talking heads, you get different, you know, dramas or like old movies, you know, playing on TNT. Or The View and no one wants to watch The Fucking View. Yeah, you get divisive (laughs) news. You know, everybody's got, you know, it's supercharged about opinion. We provide a platform that is like family friendly, brand safe, you know, engaging content, right? So most of our channels are, are you know, viral videos stitched together with, you know, in, in a specific theme, everything from Alpine TV to Beach Bum TV to Happy TV. I mean, it's on the nose. It's exactly what you think it is. We have a team of journalists building our atmosphere news, atmosphere sports, and atmosphere entertainment. You know, just think headline news with no audio. What does Sound Off Sports Center look like? That's your content profile. We provide a device and all the content to the venue operators for free. And, you know, we make our money off of ads. So it is a free ad supported television service. That's incredible. How did you decide to kind of like pivot to that to that model? And yeah, great question. So Chive TV was founded as a channel, you know, in 20 at the back end of 2014, early 15. You were coming across the time where Roku was coming in the parlance and it actually opened up their app store. And so as an audience extension play, you know, Leo and John and the team decided, hey, we should really look into building our own, you know, TV streaming app because this is the future. They used 2015, 16, like really to try to be the proof of concept, what sort of content program would work. And eventually they they found that, you know, hey, you know, we have access to a lot of viral videos. I mean, the Chive, you know, in its core is like one of the best curators of the internet. So just being able to track down, license, package, great content has always been in the DNA. And so they realized that their content format could work incredibly well for bars and restaurants. They went on the Chive, you know, asked all bar restaurant owners or, you know, anybody that worked in one, you know, if they wanted a a Roku stick. And that was kind of our initial distribution strategy that the, the guys came up with. Flash forward to when I joined the company in 2017, you had a minimum viable product that looked like it could be a monster opportunity. We had maybe five or five or six dedicated employees. You're in maybe, you know, fifteen hundred locations, but tiny, not generating next to no money. But you could see that this could be a platform of the future, right? Very similar to Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, you know, et cetera. Atmosphere is a completely vertically integrated solution. We own the customer relationship with the venue owner. It is our entire tech stack our device, our delivery. We power 100% of the content channels that appear on the platform, retain 100% of the ad inventory, and control 100% of the ad monetization. Very similar, you know, in the, and then some as far as, you know, uh, ad-supported media platforms. And I will say as a consumer of, of ch- Chive content, it, it is captivating. I kid you not, I do my daily stretching 
uh, t- while watching Chive at the gym every single day. It's like annoying to stretch, right? But I know I got to do it. I'm getting older. And it's like 15 minutes, 20 minutes just goes by like that. I mean, I, I can watch it literally w- without even thinking. I was just at my dentist and like, you know, I was waiting like 15 minutes, but I was just watching you know, happy TV. And it just, it, it reduces perceived dwell time. Yes. While you're waiting for your service, yeah. it's like just melting the time away. Cause it, I mean, it's incredibly engaging and it's designed to be our generation. And then, you know, even the one behind, like folks are very used to consuming short form video. Yeah. Our attention spans are where they're at. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of like modern day uh, magazines at the, uh, at the dentist's office. Yeah. I love what you guys are doing. Yeah. That's great. Bringing the conversation uh, a little bit back to your career, Mike, if you think about some of the things that have been critical to your success as CFO, any, anything you'd like to share? Yeah. I mean, and, and I'll even relate it back to, you know, early in my career getting laid off. I mean, like I had a mantra, like I even had a sticky note that I stuck on my laptop and it was just work harder than the guy next to you. <laughs> I've always considered myself a hustler. The same thing applies whether you're in consulting, investment banking, or, or making a move to an operating role. The things I've like where this business has really stretched me is on leadership and being, you know, being a leader. I think the biggest lesson I've gotten from that is authenticity is just be authentic with people really be willing to listen and then just let people be themselves and so i think that's the best thing about you know our culture within atmosphere today and chive media group is that we let people come as they are right you know it's like this the person you are outside of the walls is the same person you know you you're here like you don't have to pretend yeah i mean i did plenty of that on wall street (laughs) it's exhausting right (laughs) yeah shiny black shoes and pitch books and and the rest of it the other thing as well is like bring good energy i think that's critical and then with any tough decision because you're going to get a bunch do it with conviction i've learned that you know employees want leaders to lead and not waffle and so you know just be clear clearly defined in your conviction and communicate it i love it hustle Bring good energy, be authentic, and um, and make decisions and stand behind them. I think those are four really great points. Excellent. Mike, just kind of wanted to wrap it up with we're all former nerdy consultants and bankers, you know, in terms of our listeners. Any book recommendations that maybe that you've uh, read or, or listened to that uh, have, have kind of had an impact on your life? I'm a big Audible consumer. And actually during COVID, when we were, you know, not able to get everybody together in the office, I started a book club distribution list. So I got, I got plenty for you. I mean, <laughs> all right, let's hear it. One of my favorites I would, I recommend, especially anybody who's interested in, you know, the, the venture capital growth space, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. A fantastic read. If you just want like a full, like what, what makes these VC backed businesses special green lights got to be in there with McConaughey. I mean, yep. incredible listen, even if only a fraction of it's true. Um, I think <laughs> it's just a great, you know, philosophical book of our time. Yeah. Never split the difference with Chris Voss, former lead negotiator for the FBI, man, so many great lessons, tactical empathy, uh, so many things that, it, you know, just little details to, that really improve your negotiation skills, deal making. I mean, it's, it's a it's a great read. So Excellent. I gave you three. Those are three good ones. And and on the second one, it's like when I listen to McConaughey, I, even if he sounds cheesy, I can't help but feel like energized. Right? It's, it's yeah, like I, it's like I almost get mad at myself. I'm like ah. It's like the podcast version of Top Gun too. <laughs> That is the gr- that is the greatest analogy and endorsement for that book ever. Well, good stuff, Mike. Thanks so much for joining us. If our listeners want to learn more about either Chive or yourself or Atmosphere, where should they go? What what should they look up? Definitely recommend going to Atmosphere.tv. Find follow you know any of our social handles uh, and yeah, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. And if I'm not mistaken, they'll need to scroll down to the to the bottom of the page, right? And like, there's a careers link, if, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Correct. Okay, awesome. For those of you joining for the first time, make sure to subscribe uh, either on Spotify, Apple, or Amazon. And if you want to look up past episodes and get the full transcripts, you can check out beyondconsulting.info. And then last but not least, at least I hope, if you want to get in touch with me or anybody else at ECA Partners, it's going to be eca-partners.com. And until next week, we look forward to hosting our next wonderful guest. Mike, thanks so much for joining us this week. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken.